This is Michael with Glossica. Welcome everybody back to our channel. And today we have with us uh, John Renfro from Outlier Linguistics. Now what's uh, interesting is that John and I have known each other for about 10 years already. Um, and we actually worked together on some projects before doing translation between Chinese and English. So as you can imagine, John's Chinese is amazing. Um, John is now living in Japan. Um, how's your Japanese, or is that a language you had before Chinese? Yeah. No, it's my Japanese is not not anywhere close to my Chinese still. Yeah, I've lived here twice as long as I lived in Taiwan, but um, well, yeah, starting a company so, takes a lot of time, man. <laughs> so is Japanese kind of technically like like harder than Chinese to learn? I wouldn't say that. Um, it's it's more an issue of time for me. Um, oh, okay, dedication. You know, I, I started. Yeah, we we started Outlier about the same time that I moved here, um, right. and so I had all these great intentions of coming here and, and studying Japanese and getting to a high level as quickly as I could, like I did with Chinese. But uh, yeah, man, starting a company takes a lot of time. Yeah, <laughs> so definitely. it's always like Japanese is always the first thing that gets canceled for my day because I'm, you know, I've got all this other stuff to do. But actually, recently I've I've started hitting it a little harder than I had been. So. It's funny because, I mean, one of the reasons why I built Glossica to begin with was, you know, I need this tool to help me learn languages better. And then when you're <laughs> running the business, you don't actually have all that much time to, to actually use the tool. So um, right, then yeah. we think about our customers, like our customers must have the same situation. So how can we improve it over time to, right. to help people like me and my customers? So um, yeah, anyway, yeah. we're going to be, we're not going to be talking about Glossica today. We're going to be talking about outlier <laughs> linguistics um so let's let's find out a little bit more about your background and how you got involved with <clears throat> sinology or the study of um sinitic or what do you call it the the, the um scientific word for chinese sinitic sinology right. um paleography um and just mm. in general why did you get involved with learning chinese yeah so i actually i've always kind of been interested in language since i was a kid and i you know, I took Spanish like a lot of people in the U.S. do. I took Spanish in high school uh, and really enjoyed that. And like I self-studied some Latin and I wrote a paper on like the Elvish languages in the Tolkien novels. And uh, it was funny, like my, my English teacher, he was like, oh, you can write about any topic related to any English literature. And so I chose that. And he was like, could you possibly pick a more boring topic? And oh, really? <laughs> I was like, I don't think it's boring. I think it's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then so I turned in my paper and he was like, oh my God, this is fantastic. <laughs> oh, wow. So okay. I, I was like, yeah, I, I got the only A plus on the paper. He was like, you managed to take a really dry topic like this and make it pretty damn interesting. <laughs> so that's, kind of and, really it's just always, that's a real subjective point yeah, of view from a sure. teacher. Yeah, yeah. Like to say that that's, uh, I think he should be more um, motivating than that. <laughs> right, right. Well, so uh, Mr. Dasher was. Uh, everyone's favorite and least favorite teacher. Like, I mean, he was amazing. He was an incredible teacher, but he was so sarcastic and bitter, which we loved about him. It was funny, but you know, uh, but he really like, it was a fantastic teacher. I mean, he inspired a love of poetry in a bunch of us. So, uh, uh, but yeah, so then in college, um, I took Spanish again and I took like one French class, but dropped out cause I didn't like the teacher. And then, I was actually majoring in music. I think you know this, right? Um, and my my focus was on film music. And so I was watching all these movies from all over the world and basically using that as an excuse to not do homework. I'm like, oh, this is, I'm doing homework. It's related to my major. I'm just watching like 30 movies a week. <laughs> cool. And uh, I watched, uh, do you know In Xiong with uh, Jet Li Hero? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I watched that and I just, while I was watching it, I was just, I mean, the music is amazing actually, but I was listening to the language and I was just like, this is so cool sounding. Um, and and then there was this scene where this, uh, there was like this calligraphy school or like a school and there was this calligraphy teacher who like, oh, they built it up with this whole thing. Oh, there's 26 ways to write the character Jin sword. 
but he knows the 27th, you know, like this little <laughs> cheesy Kung Fu, like Wuxia thing, you know? <laughs> so, and there's a scene where he's got like the scroll laid out on the ground. He's got this like long brush that he's writing, you know, with both hands. And I was just like, dude, this is cool. And so the next day I started learning Mandarin. Uh, <laughs> the next day. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, seriously, the next day I was like, this is so cool. And so like, well, it's funny because I, a lot of those movies, uh, like Jet Li is in, is actually in Cantonese. So, uh, how did you yeah, make yeah. a choice between Cantonese? I don't know that that movie specifically, but um, right, the movie is actually you, in Mandarin. Because I, I think I, um, I noticed a lot of people they get involved with Chinese through Cantonese, specifically through Hong Kong yeah. films, and then yeah. they didn't realize like Mandarin is actually the larger language. So right, yeah, yeah. How, yeah. how did you how did you uh, decide on Mandarin? Yeah, well, so Hero is actually in Mandarin. Um, I didn't realize at the time, but it's a lot of the actors in there are heavily Cantonese accented Mandarin speakers because so, yeah, there's a lot of Hong Kong actress, uh, actors and uh, some from Malaysia. And so, and so uh, it, it's, it's accented, which I didn't know at the time. But um, I think basically I just, I was like, okay, whatever this is, I'm going to go learn it. It's Chinese. I'm going to go learn Chinese. And then I like looked up, like, what's the standard... Uh, you and know, I so I, you know, went with Mandarin. There's, there's an interesting side story to this is that, and I think a lot of people who learn languages or Chinese in general, they, they didn't know this, that um, a lot of times when they film the movies in China, they actually have all the actors speak in their own native language. And oh, yeah. then uh -huh. they do the voiceover dubbing. But what's also actually interesting about that is that some uh, traditional Italian um, uh, film producers back in the day, you know, like 50s mm -hmm. and 60s, they also had yeah, yeah. people from all over Europe, like acting in their movies, and they did the same thing. Oh, just speak French. Oh, just speak yeah. German in, in your part. And, and yeah, there's yeah. like, like those and, old Sergio Leone movies, like the spaghetti. Yeah, yeah. I don't stuff, remember right? the names, yeah, yeah. but um, yeah. it's just really fascinating from a linguistic point of view. Like, okay, people are getting together and building and like building this project, working on this project, and they're all speaking their own languages, like a kind of like a Tower of Babel. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's really interesting because, too, it's like, uh, how do you act when you can't understand what the other guy is saying? How do you play off of, of, know, what is, of what's going on, you know? That's going to be really a really fascinating experience, yeah. So that, that was kind of the, the seed for... for you that know, was where it started, yeah. For, for yeah. how you started with Chinese. Okay, cool. Yeah, and then, like, over the next few years, I just, I got more and more into it. Um, I would, I was working at, in, like, uh, retail... I was a manager of a clothing store and on my days off, which were irregular because, you know, retail is, you, you know, you might have Tuesday and Thursday off one week and the next week you've got Wednesday and Saturday off. And, um, but any time that I had a day off during the week, I would go to the university library and just sit there and study Chinese. And I ended up actually doing more studying about Chinese than I did actually learning the language. Oh, okay. Um, so I was like reading linguistics books and geeking out on the writing system. And um, I, anyway, I just got kind of more and more into it. And then eventually I didn't want to stay in that job. And uh, so I applied to uh, both Taiwan and China for scholarships and got a scholarship to go study in Taiwan, which is what I would prefer. Um, and so, you know, picked up and moved to Taiwan. And uh, the idea actually was to uh to go there and in nine months i was going to master chinese <laughs> oh okay. and i was that everybody, was the plan, everybody's right? probably like oh yeah. okay right <laughs> right 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 everyone thinks yeah yeah um it was kind of at a maybe a low intermediate level when i got there so i had learned some chinese okay. you know i used chinese pod that was one of my main things that i used before i moved to taiwan um so I had, you know, I could ask for directions. I could, I could get by in basic everyday situations. And I, I realized after about two months, and I, I went to the Mandarin Training Center at, at Shida. Okay, um, right. So National Taiwan Normal University. I guess probably most of the people watching this maybe aren't, aren't learning Chinese, right? Um, so, yeah, I, was, I started there. And after about two months, I realized, like, nine months is not going to cut it. <laughs> Well, especially so, at the Shida, at their university program, I've met yeah. people that get stuck in there for three to four years and they don't make all that much progress. Well, I mean, oh, they sure. do make yeah, progress, yeah. but it just takes a really long time to go through the whole program. Yeah. 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 Like uh, I was in the intensive choices. classes, which are a little faster, but still not, 
you know, yeah. they're not super intensive. When I first came, my choice was not to go there because I saw what had happened to other students. And so I said, well, I need to have like a more proactive um, yeah. uh, approach to this and kind of avoid the whole Shada track. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's kind of what you make of it. Like, yeah. Um, because I, I was there and I got frustrated with the, the pace, which is funny because I would talk to people in the normal class and I was in the intensive one and they're like, well, like, how do you do that? And I'm like, it's three hours a day of sitting here and then an hour or two at the most of homework. It's not that bad. Like I was on scholarship. Yeah. I was working as yeah. a tutor, but it was very, very part time. So it's like, I've got all this time in my day. Yeah. Like, I could be making a whole lot more progress. And so yeah. what I started doing is... <clears throat> I, I looked at the curriculum for ICLP, which is the like, you know, really intensive one in Taiwan. Is that one and at Taida, the Taiwan University? Yeah, yeah. Oh, and yeah, it's okay, the, yeah. so the one at, the one at, Ta at Taiwan University has two uh, Chinese programs. One is run by the university itself. And one is, I, I don't think they're run by the university. I think it's on campus, but it's run by a separate group. Right. Uh, and it was, it was started by Stanford, I think, Stanford University. Um, and then Stanford took their program to Beijing a while back and, but they, they kept running the same program. And, I always, and, yeah, uh, I always tell people to go apply to that program. I think it's the yeah. independent one within, within the Taida yeah, because yeah. when they come to Taipei, um, I, I generally kind of shy away from the Shida just, just because of what I've seen, like what happens yeah. to people when they go through it. Um, it's not, it, it doesn't seem to deliver as good as we, as good of a result as the one when when people go through the tie dot program, but it might just be because sure, yeah. it's more relaxed and, and and maybe that's what people do want. I mean, if you're doing this and you want a relaxed program, you don't really care. Like, okay, I want to become like master of Chinese in three years. Um, maybe uh, you know Shida is good for you, but um, um, but also keep in mind that the choice between Taiwan and China is also a, another kind of a, a big choice you have to make. Um, yeah, yeah. but, um, we definitely, uh, recommend Taiwan, uh, for yeah. our personal, it's a reasons. very pleasant place to live. It is. It is. And I, I don't yeah. think there's much of a culture shock either for most people because it's, it's just, everything's taken care of for you on like a, <clears throat> on a life. Everything is just convenient. You know, it's just a, a country yeah. of convenience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really. Okay. So paleography. So, yeah. I started like. Uh, yeah. Um, well, let me, let me finish up the, so I, I started modeling my like extra study on the ICLP program. So I would like go on their website and see what they do at each level. Oh, right. And then okay. I would like, cool. so for the, for the textbook I was doing at Shada, I would, uh, supplement it with stuff from the same level at, at, uh, ICLP. Your motivation so was just through up, the roof. Oh man, I was, I was really hardcore about it. Dude. Yeah, so that's why that's why all the other students are like, "How do you do it?" But I think with the right yeah, yeah. motivation, it's like you want to get this done on your own timeline, yeah. and and so I think that really helps, yeah. you know, for for our viewers that um, if you're super motivated about this thing and you want and you want to put in the hours, you're definitely gonna need to find a program that'll fit your your motivation level. Yeah, yeah, for you sure. You have to do a lot of it at your own. Yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, ICLP is great, but it's expensive. So it's like if, if oh, okay. money is a factor, then I yeah. mean, it's it's something like uh, three times the price of, of the one at Shada, something like that. Yeah. Or maybe more now, I forget. But then after a year, about a year doing that, uh, I got to a, a pretty decent level of Chinese where I could start taking like some freelance translation jobs and stuff like that. Great. Yeah. Um, and so I did that for about a year and I still still took classes at Shada, but I was a little less intense about it because I was doing translation um which does I mean it does wonders and I remember the first translation job I did oh I did such an awful job I mean I, any beginning translator anyway. the first time they do it they're like super literal about everything and then yeah. you read it and it's like this isn't English you know but um like yeah so I did that yeah. for like yeah so I did that for like a year, and, but I was always really interested in like the ancient characters, how they got to be the way they are today and stuff. And so by that point, I was, my Chinese was good enough that I could start like auditing classes in the Chinese department. Mm -hmm. So I, I audited like a graduate paleography, like intro to paleography class. Um, and at the same time, I was... Uh, preparing my application for the master's program 
in the, Is that in where that you met apartment. Ash? So, uh, I actually met Ash while I was at uh, Shida, or while I was at the MTC. Uh, I met him about three or four months after I moved to Taiwan, I think. He was, uh, you know, the picnic tables that are outside the building there. Uh, he was always there studying, and uh, I would go there after class and sit there and study. And uh, I had these, I had a big group of friends from Holland that were, they started there the same, the same semester that I started. And uh, they were over there talking to Ash once because Ash speaks Dutch really well. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then one of them came over and he, she was like, John, you like characters. Ash likes characters. You guys should meet. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, cool. And so, I mean, we just hit it off. Um, we were both, you know, super language geeks and character and then, geeks. And the, the funny thing about that is that, like, Chinese or Taiwanese people, Chinese people would be like, those are those two foreigners that really like characters. You know, all Chinese people yeah. use characters <laughs> regularly on a regular basis, but they don't think about it. They don't. Right, like, right. Like, characters <laughs> is just like, just like our ABCs, you know, we don't care about it. Yeah, and then, oh, those are those two foreigners who really like characters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is definitely us, man. So yeah, we hit it off and Ash had, you know, I had an idea before I moved to Taiwan that I was eventually one day might work on some like character etymology project. Uh, and then when I met Ash, he had already, he had come up with the same idea, but he had fleshed it out a lot more because he was, doing a PhD on this subject, you know? Oh, okay. So, yeah, he had already, know, like... Do you know the but, author of the book, jongwen.com? Uh, I don't know him personally. I know, yeah, Rick Harbaugh. Rick Harbaugh, is, right? Uh, he yeah. actually attended NTU, like, back in the 90s. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I remember he reading that. So I have that book. It's in storage right now, but... Yeah, it's a really great book. I actually um, used that book so much until it turned black and... <laughs> I mean, the pages <laughs> literally fell out, um, but I yeah. had like scribbled up notes, thousands of notes in that book. Um, excellent job. I Rick, used it too. Yeah. 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 I used it too. It's, um, and, and he would say this too. It's, it's basically his explanations are based on the Shuo Wen Jie Zi, yeah. which for people watching, it's the, basically it's the first character dictionary in Chinese. What I loved about oh, his good. dictionary was that it's, it's not arranged by radical. It's arranged by the sound components. And, and I thought that that was just a, a wonderful way, just a, yeah. a really wonderful way to learn. And, I, and so I've always been behind what you guys are doing, you and Ash, yeah. um, because it's just, it's, I think you've taken it a step further. You've gone, um, done so much, so much more work on this and for the benefit of the students. And if I were yeah. back, back at it, learning, learning Chinese, I would just, I think I think it takes a, a while for people to actually realize that there is a, a competing system to radical. I was just talking to a guy the other day. He's like, "Oh, I'm I'm going to use Glossika. I really need to work on my radicals." And I didn't say anything, but it just kind of like grated against my my spine. I was just like, "No, you don't really want to work on your radicals." Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like, but you know, I yeah, just kind of like you know, I, I let the conversation flow. <laughs> like yeah, personally, yeah, yeah. it's not what I would do. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah, there, there's a lot of that. I'm actually working on a, we, we run a bunch of video ads on Facebook and I'm filming one right now that's like, oh, I know what this guy's talking about. It's radicals, right? No. Because <laughs> um, people, I mean, they see what we do and they're like, you know, we say, oh, we explain characters by their functional components. And I'll, you know, I'll talk about that in a minute, what that means. But and then they people immediately, they look at that and they go, oh, radicals. And it's like, nope, it's not radicals. And so what I tell people, radicals are for looking up characters in a dictionary. Right. That's it. That's yeah. their whole reason for existence. The clue is in the Chinese name for radical, Hu Shou. It is the head of the section right. that that character shows up in the dictionary. It's a section heading. It's kind of um, like it's kind of like saying, "Why does giraffe start with a G?" Oh, giraffe must be somehow related to the to the character of G. Well, no, not really. That's just right. Right. I, now, I think, a lot of times, people, they, the radical kind of attach too much meaning to things. You know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the thing is, a lot of times the radical is also a semantic component in the character. Well, yeah, and so people yeah. assume that it always is. Yeah, it's it, not. It I mean, it's yeah, it's not know, always. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's it's literally just a way of looking up characters in the dictionary. So what I tell people is, is you know, you'll see this like radicals are the building blocks of Chinese characters. As yeah. I know, radicals are a, a dictionary indexing system. 
functional yeah. components. And and people go, oh, well, you're just you're just calling it a different thing. It's the same, you know. There are sound radicals and there are meaning radicals, and it's like, no, well, you're just muddying the waters if you say that. Like, <laughs> keep them separate, keep them clear, you know. Right, right, right. Radicals are for dictionaries. Components are how characters are formed. Um, so yeah, I mean, I met Ash while I was uh, I was there, and and we both kind of had this idea to do this project. And like I said, it was he had developed it much further than I had. And so we, we hit it off. And, and when I applied to, to do the master's program, uh, I got accepted uh, in, into the, and he was, in the, he was in that same department doing his PhD, right? Uh, and so I just, when I got there, I hit the ground running. I took paleography classes. I took um, exca like uh, excavated bamboo text class where we read like, like philosophical texts on, written on bamboo that they've unearthed from the warring states period. And, oh, wow. Okay. Uh, I, I, I took like, dialectology. I, what's that? Sounds like um, something very challenging to do. It's like reading Egyptian hieroglyphs or something. Off yeah, the yeah. Wall. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's not easy, man. I, I didn't know how, how challenging it was going to be, but it was so interesting <laughs> and so much fun. Uh, and actually, one of the first classes I took was uh, by a professor named Du Zhonggao. And he's like, he's a famous calligrapher, um, but then he did his PhD on paleography and specifically on how some character forms corrupted uh, by the time of uh, the Qin unification. Um, you know, when you had the first standardized, you know, set of characters. Before that, it was complete chaos yeah and then you know when they when they unified the chinese empire or whatever um and unified the writing system then you, you had the first standard and then you have a few hundred years later you you're have talking about Qin, Qin, which Qin dynasty the uh yeah Qin. Qin Huangdi, the Qin, okay yeah yeah the, the very earliest one um, okay wow it goes yeah, back yeah. a long time mm. and then a few hundred years later the the shuo wen jianzi came out which is that that character dictionary i mentioned and so his dissertation was on how certain characters had already become corrupted in their forms by the time of the Shuo At that time, okay. And, that, that's, um, a, that's probably just through scribes like mis, mis uh, copying stuff, right? Yeah, that's exactly. Uh, I mean, well, there's, there's, a few, there's a few different ways that it happens. But yeah, basically the two main ones are scribe copying or... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the actual physical actions of writing with a brush. You know? Oh, okay. Also, I mean, you might intend to write one thing, but it actually comes out differently than what you intended because you've got a soft medium that you know right. is flexible and bends as you're writing. Um, and somebody else may look at that character that you've written and go, "Huh," and see something. I've else. been writing it wrong this whole time, and yeah, yeah. think it's something else, and and it, it turns into this game of telephone, right? over, it's not over like, hundreds and hundreds or thousands right. of years. But it's not like they were in, living in a society where they were surrounded by characters and media on a consistent basis every day, like just right. bombarded like we are today uh, right. with, with the internet and everything. Um, it's like the people who knew how to read and write characters are very few and far between, and they might put it up on some sort of a monument or something. So it was like only what I'm saying is that you didn't really have that space repetition built in where you're just always looking at and you understand that character really, really well, yeah. just because you use it yeah. so often like we do today. In those days, yeah. Yeah. it was just something kind of removed from your daily life. Yeah. His class really taught me how to trace a character's evolution over time and see how it, how it changes. And a lot of times the characters that we have today are exactly the same structurally as they were when they were created. Mm, they're visually okay. different, you know, because the visually style of different. writing has changed over time, but structurally they're the same. But then a lot of characters, their structures have corrupted or, or changed over time or components have been added or taken away. And, um, Actually, I mean, I have a very curious <clears throat> question. It's not in my uh, list of questions here, but since you mentioned it, because you were I, I think in we the, kind of got away from the list a little bit. <laughs> yeah, we did. But um, you were in this class, and I'm actually, because I know a lot of Taiwanese and Chinese people in general, you know, in just daily life, but I'm just kind of like... Yeah. Really it's like which like what who are your classmates in a paleography class <laughs> i mean the taiwanese people like the yeah yeah, yeah. probably probably kind of a um not a very popular class or 
like who, who what kind yeah. of people actually signed up for this class <laughs> i mean i can <laughs> see why foreigners would get involved with this class because it's like super yeah. fascinating from uh -huh. from an edic point of view but um yeah i'm kind of interested like what taiwanese people would be signing up for this class yeah um it's actually so the the chinese department so it's it's not a paleography book department it's the overall chinese department and they do chinese literature chinese oh, history okay. chinese philosophy calligraphy all this stuff is in, is in one department but everybody has certain required classes oh, okay in as, as an undergrad you have certain required classes in paleography in uh phonology and in i guess semantics would be so the that's word. required so, so. Uh, yeah so those uh, those three are traditionally called xiao xue. okay and so those are those are considered to be the three fundamental things for understanding ancient chinese texts right oh so, you so know, then, i study that yeah 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 so yeah the phonology <clears throat> um yeah and then semantics would be xu xue. um yeah so i guess some people just you know they go into the chinese department because they want to teach chinese you know they want to be like high school chinese teachers in taiwan or something like that okay. um but then but then when they take those classes they get really interested in that specific aspect of the, of the department and so when they go to grad school they specialize in that i think oh, is, okay. is what happens with most of them um i mean i guess i guess some people are probably interested in that from the beginning but i, I right. think a lot of it happens when they start studying that stuff in undergrad and they go hey this is fun okay you know? cool so it's there's fun. a lot to discover in there so you had mentioned earlier that you know back in your library days that you had read so much about um chinese culture and all of that so like did you discover any insight into like uh chinese culture just from you know the later days when you're studying the writing system that may have um reversed what you had learned before maybe from your library days um mm -hmm. or any anything that you had picked up um that kind of like changed your your mind um kind of i mean yes or no one thing is like i mean when you're studying like the origins of the writing system you're talking about like shang and western Zhou culture which is where when most of the characters were created and of course those are like the origins of modern chinese culture but but they're quite different from from modern chinese culture you know um so kind of but then you do a lot like i said we read a lot of like philosophical texts so one of the one of the most active parts of the field of paleography right now is deciphering all these bamboo strips that are being dug up you know in, di in different parts of china um and a lot of these texts are philosophical texts and oh, okay. they are well there's a lot of confucius there's a lot of laozi there's a lot of um are you saying that these are phrases that people have not seen before in the literature? There's like new sometimes. So new phrases. yeah, there's some of them are new. Some of them are, some of them are identical to what we have today. Some of them are the same text, but they've been altered. Like the received version that we have today mm. has been edited by later scholars to change the meaning. Okay. Um, so there was, well, you know, there was the, I don't, I don't know if you know, the, there was like the book burning during the Qin Empire, uh, the Qin during, Dynasty. During um, when? Qin, Qin Zhao. Oh, there was a book right. burning during that. Oh, okay. Yeah, the so, so basically, huh? <laughs> yeah, kind of. Uh, okay. So any, any, like, they ordered all books, I may get this wrong, but I think it's all books that didn't ad adhere to the legalist doctrine to be burned. <clears throat> wow, okay. um, and then later later scholars when they were like reconstructing some of these they basically what they had to do well they had they had all these different versions of these books and they had to look at all these different versions that they had and, and figure out what the correct version was going to be and then from then on this was during the, the Han Dynasty right and from then on that was the correct or we call it the received version of the text but then when you when you look at the excavated versions a lot of times it's the same passage but there are significant significant differences in the wording um and so 
yeah, for, like learning the philosophy, and I'm not very good with all the philosophy. Like that, that wasn't my specialty, so I'm a little shaky with it. But but just having to read those texts and stuff does give you a lot of well to give uh, our viewers insight into stuff. to give our viewers kind of a point, um, like a, a a point of view on the time span. What 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 are the dates that you could give us for like the Qing and the, and the uh, Eastern Zhou? Oh yeah, so so Qing Dynasty <clears throat> was um, started in 221. Uh, BC. So, uh, but that, I mean, there was a Qin kingdom before that. So there is, before that unification, there was this period called the Warring States. So um, what about the Han Dynasty? Han Dynasty came after. So Han, Qin Dynasty was very short. It was something like 21 years. Was like, like that. I thought the Qin was like thousands of years earlier. Maybe my own memory is not. Yeah. No. Uh, so, so, the earliest text that we have, the Oracle Bone script, um, is from the Shang Dynasty, and that's those are from around 1350 BC. Oh, that's the one I was thinking. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's probably the one you're thinking of. So uh, Confucius and then later actually, was, so Confucius actually lived, um, I think, 2500 BC, so which predates, or no, Confucius was around 500 BC. Oh, 500 so it BC. Before, oh, it's 2500 yeah. before now. Okay, so 500 yeah, yeah, BC. Right, so he. Right. He ended up living between the Shang and Qing dynasty. Uh, yeah, so there was that that period that he lived was called the Spring and Autumn period, Chunqiu. Oh, okay. Uh, and it was it was just before the Warring States period. So you have, you have the Shang dynasty, then you have the Western Zhou, and then you have you can call it Eastern Zhou, but that that includes the Spring and Autumn and the Warring States period. Oh, okay. And the Warring States period, you've got like all these different kingdoms that are warring. You know, they're they're literally at war with is each that, other, and then eventually Qin wins and unify, unifies it. Is that where the book uh, Sangu Yi comes from? Uh, Sangu Yi is a little later than that, so that's um, post Han Dynasty. Oh, okay. So that's a, at the end of the Han Dynasty when it's breaking up, and it breaks up into like three kingdoms. Oh, and that okay. that was around. 200 AD, a little later than 200 AD. Is that what they right? call I'm, like Wei? I'm kind of rounding all these dates, but okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, Wei is, yeah. One of, is part of the three kingdoms, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Wei okay. and Qing, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then so uh, far, that, for, the, for the viewers, because I mean, even for me, like, I, I mean, I know Chinese and all that, but I don't know my history yeah. dates all that well. But for like, <laughs> right. for most for most people, they're, they're going to hear um, the, the most um, famous dynasties you'll ever hear about are probably like Tang. And I know that's around like 680. Yeah. The yeah, Qing dynasty there. is the one that just passed 100 years ago, 110 years ago. So yeah, yeah. like you'll probably hear these names much more commonly. Um, but the ones we're yeah. discussing uh, with paleography go back thousands of years. Okay, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's funny. Like, you know, if you, if you look at like Tang dynasty, I mean, the characters during the Tang dynasty, they're already pretty much modern characters, right? Right. Um, but but if you read poetry from then for, for a modern speaker it's like uh it's tough you know i mean it's difficult it's classical chinese and yeah but co compared to the stuff that i specialized in i mean the Tang dynasty people might as well be walking around with cell phones it's so <laughs> modern <laughs> yeah it's so modern yeah well Tang yeah. dynasty poetry is supposed to rhyme but it rhymes with a language that's 1500 years old today so yep yeah. Um, that's like saying it still rhymes pretty well in Cantonese. Cantonese that's like saying preserved a lot of it's rhymes. it's written in Chaucerian English that but predates it by another five hundred years. <laughs> so it's it's right, like yeah, literally yeah. <laughs> like ancient English um, because language kind of yeah. does change at the same pace across the world. So that's like saying you're yeah, trying yeah. to read super old English using modern yeah, yeah. Well, and actually, modern yeah, pronunciation I guess, means you're, yeah yeah. yeah. Tang Dynasty would be about the same time as Beowulf. Beowulf, right? yeah. And so, yeah, and so modern English speakers, we can't read Beowulf in the in oh. the original without specializing in it, you know. Right. Uh, but so, that's the great thing about Chinese yeah, is that yeah. the characters don't change over time, but their pronunciation does. So you can still read things from that long ago, but um, yeah. if you were to pronounce it in the modern voice it would not rhyme. So how has Chinese helped you learn Japanese then? Um, it helps tremendously, man. Uh, it's funny because 
uh, Ash actually met somebody once that was like, oh, I have a friend that knows Chinese. He says he knows 4,000 characters and it doesn't help with Japanese at all. And it's like, <laughs> if he knows 4,000 characters, he already knows all the kanji, you know, like all the exactly. kanji that are in common use. Like right. he might have to learn a few dozen that are, that are common yeah. in Japan that aren't common in Chinese, but right. of course it helps. And there's so many, like, I, I tell people like Japanese is something like a third of Japanese words are borrowed from English or other exactly. Western languages. A third of them are borrowed from Chinese and the rest are native Japanese words. I mean, Japanese is, is an you can, amalgam. You can read, Jap a, read J a Japanese novel with knowledge of English and Chinese, except you may not be able to understand what oh. people are saying. <laughs> right. I mean, you, you can kind of get the gist of what's going on, you know? Exactly. I just got a couple more questions. Um, sure. Let's, let's um, focus on beginners. Um, what do you think that they should focus on um, with learning either Japanese or Chinese? Uh, should they learn how to write? You know, what, what are your suggestions? Um, well, I think when you're starting any language, I think you should, personally, I it completely ignore the writing system altogether. Even when I was starting Japanese and I had this advantage of knowing all the kanji from Chinese, I wouldn't even look at the sentences I was learning because what I wanted to get was, I wanted to get the phonology of the language under my, under my belt, you know, right. um, and, the, and the pronunciation, the rhythms. Yeah. Um, we actually, we, we make a, we're, we're the character guys, but we make a pronunciation course too that's been super popular and very successful. Uh, we've had some people that have just overhauled their, their accents. Cool. Um, and it's, it's, the course has to do with teaching you to ignore what you're seeing and listen. Listen intensively and imitate what you hear. And, and then do it over and over and over, training that muscle memory, like, you know, like what you talk about. Do they need to register the character in their mind when they hear it? I mean, what's, cause this is something that I went through. I'm just wondering what is your suggestion? Cause I, I feel like if I don't register the character in my mind, I really don't understand what I'm hearing. Oh, really? That's interesting. Um, I don't know. I, when I'm speaking Chinese, I don't, I don't really think about characters that much unless maybe if I hear a word that I don't know, but I sort of understand in context, then I might, you know, I might understand it because the character pops into my mind as I'm right. trying to make sense of, of what the word is. But, right. um, well, it's kind of like, I don't know, every, everyone kind of thinks differently when they speak languages, you know, some native speakers of English think in, in letters while, while they're speaking and some don't. Yeah, you know, so I, I don't know. But I, I do think that the focus at the beginning should be on getting the sound system. You can learn, you know, Definitely. um, how to write what you're learning and stuff like that. No. Cool. Yeah, I would, I would also um, recommend to users to be able to transcribe any sentence they hear in Chinese, at least in pinyin, uh, as best as you can. Oh, absolutely. It, it just yeah. tests your ability to, to hear each syllable clearly. Yeah. 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 It amazes me how many beginning learners or even have a grasp of of pinyin or, or the phonology at all and they'll say these things about um oh the the i is pronounced in and it's like it is pronounced it's just a different i that than gtc you know and and they just don't they don't know the rules at all they're like oh well there's all these exceptions in pinyin and it's like they're not it's it's a really regular system if it you is. know the rules it is yeah um and, and so, yeah, I would definitely recommend mastering that. It, it's super useful. And if you're able to, yeah, like you said, be able to transcribe anything you hear in opinion, it's an invaluable skill. Now, us Taiwanese guys, um, we're obviously in the traditional camp for learning Chinese characters. Um, what is your stance, maybe from a more objective point of view, would be, um, should people start off with traditional or should you go to the simplified camp? You know, what if, you, what if you're already in Beijing learning Chinese or Shanghai learning Chinese? Um, what do you suggest to people? I mean, I would, I would say that eventually these people would like to learn, learn, at least they would like to be able to read traditional at some point. Um, so if yeah. that's in their list of goals, um, but they're actually in the simplified camp right now, what are your suggestions? Yeah, so I, I think anybody that's going to use Chinese professionally at a high level is going to have to be comfortable with both. Um, as far as which one to start with, I mean, it's, it's a debate that gets really heated, you know, but 
I, I'm, I'm really practical about it. What are your needs? If you're living in Beijing, uh, start with simplified, you know. Sure. Um, and even in our dictionary, when we explain characters, um, we explain whenever possible, we explain the simplified character on its own terms without referring to the traditional version. Uh, if it's still like, like shuo hua da hua, right? It's still, in it's still the same structure as the traditional version. It's just that one of the components is written differently, but it's yeah. still the same two components. Um, so for characters like those, we don't even talk about traditional. Now, there are some simplified characters that you can't really understand why they look the way they do without referring to the traditional because they're shorthand abbreviations or, you know, cursive that's been straightened out into, into kaishu. Um, to, to simplify. So for those, we always, you know, we say this component is an abbreviation of such and such, and we show how the abbreviation works, like graphically. Maybe I could ask you uh, a question, just kind of off yeah. the top of my head. Uh, I, I didn't prep you beforehand. Um, but <laughs> one thing, it. one character that always bothered me was uh, Jing Wei, the Wei, because the, it's actually really easy to write in the traditional but then the simplified wow. is like completely different. Like what, how did they ever come up with that? We have in our dictionary, we have, let me see if I can get it to show up on screen. Yes. We have these little uh, illustrations. Way, yeah, it's just kind of traditional, a, yeah. Yeah, but it, can you see the part that's red? Yes, at the top in the middle, yes. Yeah, yeah, so that, oh, that that's looks basically like... where the, uh, that's where it comes from, yeah. It's like they take it's that like little one bit tiny piece of that character. <laughs> <laughs> I would have not... How did you guys figure that yeah. out? That's insane. That would have been. Let me see. We've got a reference for it. Oh, so okay. there, for a lot of these, like That's actually for crazy. for how did they come up with that? Have an explanation for we we give citations for where we got the info. Uh, it's from this book. So this is a but really. Is let me see if I can get it to show I'm, up. But when I write that, I, it goes through the top of the of the character. Sao Guan Yong, Sao Yun. Oh, okay. I don't know what yeah. Sao Yun. Oh uh, yeah, it's called Jian Hua Han Zi Jie Shuo. Um, and it's it's a pretty good. I mean, they don't get everything right, but they get a lot of stuff right. Uh, okay, it's so, a good resource on like how certain characters got simplified. Oh wow. Okay. So That's yeah, weird I, because when I, I, I would type, think that. Yeah, when I write that character, it, I go through the top of the. That sure, vertical. but I, I would imagine, I, yeah, yeah. I'd have to look it up, but I bet in like Cao Shu, like in cursive, you probably don't. Uh, I would have to look at the actual cursive what's form your, of that character to know. What's your stroke order on the, on the traditional? Do you start with the vertical first or do you start with the hook? I start with the vertical, yeah. I start with the vertical, yeah, but I bet in Cao Shu it's, it starts with the hook, I bet. I think I start with the hook. I would hook. imagine. Not, I actually I'm took a to, class on Cao Shu a few years ago. Oh, do you? Or, okay. do I, or do I start with the vertical? It's actually hard to remember now how I do it. Because <laughs> that, 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 that component also shows up in the word for Korea, Han, right? Is it the same? Or right, the bottom yeah, is yeah. different. The bottom um, is different. In way, it actually has an upside down chu. Yeah, so it looks like the stroke order in uh, China for the, like their traditional stroke order starts with the vertical and the standard in Taiwan starts with the hook oh it starts with the okay so i learned the, the yeah. taiwan stroke order okay that makes sense and, and i must have learned i, start with I the must have learned the mainland stroke order. yeah okay so yeah, there is some the interesting PRC actually they, they have their own uh they have their own traditional stroke order in the prc too and their own traditional stroke taiwan, order so. that's crazy yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> even though they use simplified they have a standard for for traditional too it's always weird when you see somebody writing and they use a different stroke order, it like messes with your brain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and the stroke order in Japan is quite different too. And oh, so wow. I'll be okay. writing something and I, I use Chinese stroke order because I'm just used to that. Right, or, you and know, it messes I, with their brain? <laughs> it does, they're like, no, no, that's not right. And I'm like, I'm not gonna relearn stroke order just for Japanese. I'm like, <laughs> and the, exactly. the character turns out correctly, but you know. Right. Uh, although I would say like, if you're learning, you should learn whatever standard, you know, yeah. that you're learning. That's a really good um, point to make for, for anybody. But else. when you go to another language, like uh, there's no point in relearning it once you already know it. Yeah. And I've noticed that um, Taiwanese people have a very Taiwanese look to their characters when, and then Japanese will have a very Japanese look to their, when they're writing. And so you can almost classify somebody's writing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, that, 
even if they're writing in Chinese, you say, oh, that person has a Japanese yeah. cursive style or, or, or writing style. Yeah. yeah, that's really fascinating. You can totally tell, yeah. Japanese people use a lot less cursive in their handwriting. Uh, oh, I've noticed okay. they're, yeah. Chinese people tend to write very cursively in their, in their daily lives and Japanese yeah. people, I mean, they do occasionally in certain contexts, but if they're writing a note to somebody, it's pretty kaishu. <laughs> Yeah, I like I mean, how Taiwanese pretty... will write like the yu zi pang. They just uh -huh. go like this. It's like right. a, <laughs> a hook, a loop, and then up. Like they do the yeah. number two, right? And it's just like, oh, that's very Taiwanese. <laughs> right. Talking to you today, John, it's yeah, been several too. years since we've talked and met. Um, is there anything well, yeah. else that um, you wanted to let our viewers know, like how they can um, find um, what, yeah, what is your program? I don't think they... Um, if if our you if our viewers have not heard of you before, they may not know what it is that you offer, and so yeah, yeah. I think that that's probably the the biggest value we can deliver um, in today's talk is what is that piece of software you just showed us, and how can they get yeah, it? Yeah, so we we have a few products. What I just showed you was our dictionary, um, and it's it's called the Outlier Dictionary of Chinese Characters, uh, which basically explains each character why it looks the way it does in very simple terms. Um, now, sometimes we do show the ancient form of characters um, when it's useful. Um, but as much as we are kind of known as the ancient character guys, that's not the point of the dictionary. The point of the dictionary is here's the logic of the writing system, you know, bringing people clarity on, on how the Chinese writing system works. Um, so they can get that either in Plico, if they have, you know, the Plico dictionary app, or they can buy it on our website, outlierlinguistics.com. Um, we also have an online course called the Chinese Character Masterclass, where we teach people, you know, exactly how characters work and how to learn them more effectively. It's been a super popular course. We have well over a thousand people that have taken it, 1,200 people, something like that. Um, and it's, you know, we've gotten a lot of praise for it. So um, there's that, there's the pronunciation course, which I already talked about. Uh, where we start from the very basics mindset, how to approach learning pronunciation, and then we teach all the consonants and vowels and tones and all that, the, the little basics, we combine them into syllables, multi-syllable words, and then we move on to phrases and longer passages. So we teach people how to develop a really good, clear, near-native-like accent from the very beginning and as far as they want to go. Um, and we also have some posters that teach people about semantic co components in Chinese characters. Uh, and our stuff is coming out for Japanese soon too, so. How many characters are currently available in the, uh, do you have those st stats that are in the, in the um, dictionary? <clears throat> yeah, something like, I've got it right here actually, I can pull it up, so. You guys like have every character that a student would ever have to know, right? <laughs> We're getting pretty close to that. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> the goal is at the end, we're going to have 4,000. Okay. Well, 4,000 plus. Um, we're, I think we're around 3,000 right now. So let me see. Yeah. I think once you hit like three, 3,000 plus, you're starting to get into more literature type of stuff. Yeah. It's beyond yeah, yeah. what you so need to we, use we, for speaking. Yeah. We've got right around 2,750 right now. Okay. Um, but we actually have the research done for the rest of the characters that we're going to include, except for like a couple dozen. So okay. we've already got the research done for another more than a thousand characters, which we'll be adding to the dictionary, you know, in batches until it's finished. Okay. So, so you have a workflow here. that starts with the research and then you, you push it out to the, to the app. Yeah. So we do the research and then we convert the research into actual like, you know, student friendly, entries right. for the dictionary and then once we've got enough to release <clears throat> you know 250 or so at a time 500 sometimes depending on you know what else we've got going on so um, 3000 yeah, let me we, ask you a different kind of a question here um 3000 yeah. characters is a, is a big mass um and then like a student who's probably like a a1 or maybe hsk1 um you know what how how should they um is there is there a certain order or a frequency or maybe a certain order of like, here's the quickest way to learn these characters based on their patterns. Um, do you guys provide right. that in the app, like some sort of a learning um, progress? How yeah, I mean, 
there's there's been this sort of and i i think part of it has to do with um the popularity of heisig's uh you know remembering the kanji and remembering the hanzi or you know the hanzi yeah um that you know people are fascinated by the order that he teaches the kanji because he starts from you know basic blocks and builds up and but his approach assumes that you're not learning the language alongside so you you cram all these characters into your mind at the beginning and then you start learning the language um i don't think that's a very great way to go about it um i think a more practical solution because people it's crazy to learn 3,000 characters up front. You know, I mean, it's, yeah. you may not ever need that. Yeah. You know, uh, not, not everybody needs to get to a super high level in Chinese. You know, so some people just want to live day to day lives. So I would say the, the order is not so important. Learn them in the order that your textbook teaches them, basically, or in the order that you need them. So that's good, right? Okay. So yeah. I want to ask you a question Are you a Heisig detractor? No, no. I, I used Heisig, actually. <clears throat> oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I used it, and and the the mnemonic stuff is cool. You know, it's great. Okay. The a problem with his approach is that it, a lot of times the way he cuts up characters into components, those components are not actually functional within the characters. So See, it that's actually why, that's why I'm a detractor. The logic. That's right, why I'm right, a detractor because right. when I picked up Heisig and I looked at it, I was like, no, there's no. I'm not going to remember stuff like this because I like I like to learn things the way they were originally logically yeah. structured and it seems like yeah. he's just adding on some sort of like modern day adaptation story mnemonic yeah, yeah, yeah. and, I, and i'm not i'm not, i'm a really big fan of not doing that <laughs> yeah well i mean I, I think i'm, I'm into you, etymology so i really love the history of words and where they came from and so i, I want to yeah, know yeah. that like w one thing that's fascinating to me is that the word for um for uh, honey mead m-e-a-d it uh -huh. actually has the same root as Chinese meat or meat. meat. Yeah, yeah. And then uh -huh. well, it originally had a T at the end of the word. So it's just like, to me, that's just fascinating that a Chinese word and an English word have the same etymology. And so yeah. um, that's, I'm, I'm completely into like, don't teach me folk <laughs> etymologies on things. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, the thing is, these memory techniques can be really effective. Um, and yeah, some I know that there's a ton too. of fans. There's a lot of people yeah, out there that love it. Yeah. But I would say if, if you're going to use them, you should base your memory stories on the character's real logic, like yeah. the real structure. Yeah. Uh, and then if you forget your memory story, you still have something real that you can tie it to. Right. So that's something we actually, um, there's a memory expert, uh, Anthony Mativier. Oh yeah. Um, and he, you know, okay. And, and he has a little, uh, he, he made a little course about using memory techniques to learn Chinese characters oh, okay. that we sell as, so we have this uh, bundle. It, if, if you wanna buy all of our products together, you, there's a webinar on the, on the bundle page and you can watch this webinar and we give you like a, dis, a huge discount on, on our bundle of products. Plus you get this course by Mativier about using memory techniques to learn Chinese characters. Oh, okay. And he specifically uses our dictionary to inform his like oh, okay. memory stories. So it's cool. I mean, it, but you can only get it, you know, as part of that bundle. It's not something that we sell elsewhere. Um, does he, does he use the, um, the, uh, what do you call it? The, the house or the, um, um, is it some sort of like, Oh, the, like, uh, the method of Loki or whatever. You're, you're inside of a, a building. Is it, he uses that technique? Yeah. technique of, Mem yeah memory palaces. Uh, yeah. Memory he palace, uses that. House. He, yeah. He uses that. He uses a bunch of different memory techniques. Okay. Uh, that's one of them for sure. Um, yeah, I and, never, and it's I was cool, never really good with those memory techniques. Like I tried using the memory palace and stuff like that, and I just felt I got frustrated a lot. And so I just, yeah. for me, I I kind of like to have um, some sort of a grounding with like, okay, the roots of this word goes back to a certain thing that I can already that's already in my mind. It's already yeah. has a, a a node or a connection in my mind, and then I can connect it to that thing. So like. The memory palace is like something for me is just like detached from my own reality. So I always yeah. had, had a hard time kind of like using it. Yeah. Yeah. But well, I mean, you're using memory techniques of your own though, right? Cause you're, yeah, you're I, one of the yeah. principles of memorization is to like use things that you already know to learn things that you're trying to acquire. 
Yeah, I no, have these exactly nodes, and I just so. try to attach yeah. to what I already know. Yeah. Yeah. I've right. never, like, I mean, I used memory stories when I was learning characters, but I was never very good at it, and I never really got into all the other stuff. Ash is really into it. Okay. Like, he could talk memory techniques all day. Oh, I, I really like how we got a lot of, a lot of discussion in today, and um, just thank you so much for taking your time uh, to talk That's to us fun. today. And do um, you guys have anything coming up? We're getting ready to release the Japanese version of our dictionary. Okay. Um, we signed a, a licensing deal with a app called Yomiwa. Mm. It's a dictionary app for uh, for iOS and Android. Sounds and they like are hard reading Japanese. Is that what it means? Uh, oh, no. Yo, I, I think it's I think it's a question. Yomiwa nandeska. Oh, okay. But, like, it's, it's what what's the reading? Oh, okay. Uh, oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> I think that's what it is. Um, so the, yeah, wa, it's, the it's wa a cool, is, a, is, a, is a particle wa, not a Japanese wa. I would think so. I haven't asked the okay. owners, actually, because, you know, the, the app name is written in, in Romaji, you know, Latin oh, okay. letters. Oh, okay, right. So, but that's, that's my impression, is that's, that's what it's intended to be. Um, but, yeah, it's a cool little app, and they're going to be releasing our dictionary through their app, like as an in-app purchase. It's also available on our website. You know, people can pre-order it before it comes out on our website if they want. Cool. Uh, so right now, that's we're focusing on getting that out. Uh, we've also got a bunch of new expert entries coming out for our, for both our Chinese and Japanese dictionary. And I'll, I'll show you what the expert entry is real quick. So the expert, there's two versions of our dictionary and the expert version has these extra entries where you can like see the history of the character, how it evolved over time. We give all these like interesting tidbits about the character things like that. So for people that are really into the history of the writing system or who just like to read that stuff or look yeah. at the ancient characters, that's the version to get. Um, so we're, that's definitely, we what just added. Get. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's cool. Um, the entries take a lot of time to make. So yeah, there's about 200 so far. We're going to release another 50 pretty soon, hopefully yeah. in February, maybe March. Okay, um, cool. Yeah. So, and then, yeah, just churning out more of that. Um, Finishing up our pronunciation course. We got a lot going on, man. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like you're really busy. All right. So we'll talk to you soon. All right. All right. Sounds good, man. All right. Take care. Bye.